Welcome to Southern Gables Church Online, where we're all about loving God, loving others, and making disciples. We're so glad you've joined us. My name is Al Hodges. I'm one of the pastors here at Southern Gables, and we greet you. We're glad that you've joined us online. Whether you're a regular attender, a member, or a visitor to Southern Gables, we would love to have you click on the button right below the screen and register your attendance. Also ask for prayer in a particular area if you would like. That would be great. Also, if you have an elementary students uh, in your home and uh, they're watching, uh, we would ask you to also click on the button next to register and uh, that will download some materials that are appropriate for your elementary school kids. Coming up a week from Wednesday, October 21st, it's our worship and prayer time called One Thing. And in addition to One Thing on the 21st, at 5.30 we'll be joining for a Chick-fil-A dinner. Come at 5.30 for Chick-fil-A. The uh, One Thing worship and prayer time starts at 6.30, and we look forward to having you here for both dinner and the worship time. That's on October 21st. You can register for that on sgc.org. That's our website. And uh, also go to the events page where one thing is and you can register for that under that area. Also, we wanna let you know of a couple of outreach opportunities. On Halloween, Saturday, October 31st, we have had a number of people from Southern Gables indicate their interest in participating in trunk or treat. It's an opportunity to reach out to families and kids in the neighborhood and also perhaps in your neighborhood who may be a little bit squeamish about going door to door this year, uh, trick or treating. And so Southern Gables is going to be putting this on in the north parking lot. We hope that you'll join us, invite your friends. And also, if you can, between now and then, drop off some candy at the church on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night or during the week at the church office. Also, it's Operation Christmas Child time. Shoebox time is here. The Southern Gables uh, goal is 250 uh, shoeboxes to be given out to kids all around the world through Samaritan's Purse. And you can pick up some pre-printed shoeboxes here at the church on a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, or sometime during the week when the office is open. And uh, those uh, shoeboxes are due back on November 22nd. Thanks for paying attention to those items of interest, of events, and ministry opportunities. And we look forward to worshiping the Lord together in these coming minutes. Thanks for joining us. You have put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise, a sound that resonates, that all of heaven and earth may worship you. We tread the hills to meet with you, to see your majesty in all that surrounds us. For it speaks and displays the eternal God of ages, creator, author, victor. In love, you established an everlasting covenant with your people, and it's your love that captivates us. As children of the King, we rush in as waves unrestrained, overcome, overwhelmed, that the king crowned in glory and splendor would reach down to place a crown upon our heads. So we raise our banner, the banner we boldly stand under, the banner of Jesus Christ. From dusk to dawn, from age to age, your praise resounds in all the earth, deliverer, Redeemer, ruler of an everlasting kingdom that cannot be shaken. We trust in the name of Christ Jesus, the only King forever. Well, hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to sing to our King and let's Worship him now. Here we go.
from you as we worship. 
So, Lord, here we are. Speak to us. We ask in your name. Good morning, Southern Gables Church. It is good to be seen by you today. I hope you're doing well. Please get your Bible out and turn with me to the book of Ephesians as we continue our new series called Kingdom Down. Kingdom Down, living for Jesus in a culture in crisis. It was last week that we looked at Jeremiah 18 and saw that God deals with all kingdoms and all nations consistently. When a nation turns from its sin, God turns from his judgment. We, the people of God, can lead the way in preserving our nation by repenting personally and praying for repentance nationally. This is what it means for the church of Jesus Christ to be salt and light, a city on a hill. Therefore, we're going to press deeper into our time of prayer for our nation on Wednesday, October 21st, when we gather together for one thing, our most important meeting of the month. I would like to ask you, would you make this time a priority as we seek the face of God together during this time of national crisis? I hope you can come on out early and enjoy a little Chick-fil-A with us. We're going to have dinner. You need to RSVP for that. Come on out and hang out with your spiritual family as we pray together. Today, we're going to dive deeper into a difficult but profoundly relevant topic, race and racial reconciliation. Our nation has been rocked by a series of tragedies involving the deaths of George Floyd, uh, Ahmoud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and more, all African Americans and we've seen a destructive outrage that's followed. Uh, The issue of race, as much as we wish it would just go away, is still a pressing issue of concern in our country. How should followers of Jesus Christ think about the issue of race and reconciliation? How can we, the people of God, live kingdom down and not culture up? How can we be the answer to our own prayer on earth? as it is in heaven. Before diving in, I want to ask you to extend to me and to one another an extra measure of grace as we explore this topic. As I was doing my research, I was struck by the divergent perspectives within the body of Christ on the topic of race and reconciliation. What's the problem? What are the causes? And what's the solution? So I hope we can listen and pray and grow together today. As we look at this topic together, three questions come to mind. What does a small town boy from Northern California know about racial tensions? Okay, and secondly, why should we care about racial harmony? And then third, what can we do about it? So let me begin by sharing with you a little bit of my experience with ethnic diversity. I was born in Northern California, and my formative years were spent in a small town in the Sierra Nevada mountains. My upbringing did not present me with many opportunities to experience ethnic diversity. In my early years, my only experience with ethnic diversity was our yearly pilgrimage to watch the Oakland Athletics play baseball. When we drove through Oakland, we locked our doors 
and we did not make eye contact with the people who lined the street as we were waiting for the stoplight to turn. And after the game, we would quickly get out of town before night fell. Uh, Through my small town high school years, I did not personally know a single person of color. There just weren't that many where I lived. My greatest exposure to people of color came when our high school would travel down to Sacramento to compete against the inner city schools. I can remember hearing others tell jokes about how people of color dressed, okay, how they talked, uh, the food they ate, and how they were all, in their estimation, lazy welfare cheats. During my college years, my world expanded when I attended the University of California at Davis. Most of my classes were graded on the curve, and I can remember the white students complaining about how the Asian students were always pushing them down into the middle of the pack. So, through these formative years, my exposure to ethnic diversity was extremely limited and not necessarily the most positive. Because of ignorance and fear, some racial stereotypes developed in my heart. It was not until I came to faith in Christ and moved to the South to attend seminary that some of my blinders were removed. In Dallas, we found a deeper consciousness of race relations than we ever had experienced before. For the first time ever, I was in class with black students, with Asian students, with Hispanic students, and students from all around the world. As I listened to their experiences, which were so different than mine, I came to see that racism was more than an occasional problem for them. But for many of them, it was a continuing reality. Black students told me stories of visiting predominantly white churches in Dallas and being told, we aren't racist here, but you probably feel more comfortable in a church for people like you. Or when Christie managed the bank in Dallas, older white customers would come in and say, good job hiring that young black man. He's one of the good ones. We heard stories from young black women about how they would go shopping and the clerk would follow them all around the store. Uh, incessantly asking, can I help you find something? Assuming that they were going to be shoplifting. And what I learned during these years was this. My experience is very limited, and it does not reflect the experience of others. And just because I do not see racism does not mean that it does not exist. To this day, I have friendships with people of color who were forged during my seminary years, and at times I've marveled at how differently they see the world from how I see the world. At times I wonder, how can we believe the same thing about the gospel, the biggest thing, the truest thing, the most important thing about us, and yet be so far apart on matters of how we see race and politics? I've come to see that I need to be respectful of people's feelings, and their experiences. I need to listen to their stories without mentally forming my rebuttal while they're still speaking. On statistics and policies, we may disagree, but I need to listen to the very real pain of others created equally in the image of God. As the Bible says, I need to learn to weep with those who weep and to bear one another's burdens in love. A few years ago, when I went to Senegal, I got a small taste of what it's like to be an ethnic minority. In Senegal, I was the person of color. They were very dark and I'm very white. Uh, They were very tall and very lean. I was short and fat. Okay, they stared at me. I was looked at suspiciously everywhere I went. It was assumed that I was rich, which is true, but not in the way that they imagined. For the first time in my life, I felt truly vulnerable. And let me ask you, what is your story? What perspectives or experiences have shaped the way you see matters of race and reconciliation? I think many white people like to think of themselves as being colorblind, but being white is an ethnic identity that matters a great deal historically. Many of us have never really thought about that. 
So my story is the story of someone who has been somewhat of an outsider overhearing the conversation about race and reconciliation from a distance, but now is reluctantly entering into the conversation. Why am I entering into it? Well, because it's a relevant topic and because race and reconciliation are gospel issues. Okay, issues of the gospel that have to be addressed. So why should we care about race and reconciliation? Because race and reconciliation matter deeply to our Lord Jesus, and he came to bring us together. Now, before diving into Ephesians chapter 2 today, I want to give you a quick overview of how the Bible storyline makes us care deeply about racial reconciliation. First of all, we have creation. Creation. God made one man, and then out of one man, he made every ethnicity of mankind, and he even appointed the boundaries of where they would live. Paul said to the philosophers on Mars Hill, who were very proud of their Greek ethnicity, he said to them, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Okay, this was a not so subtle, subtle jab, okay, a blow against their racial pride. So we have a creation, then we have the fall. The fall in the Tower of Babel led to ethnic differences and set in motion our history of ethnic hatred. Ever since the fall, the sad story of humanity is one continual fracture between the races after another. Okay, racism and hatred are part of this old fallen order. So we have creation, fall, and redemption. When Jesus died on the cross, God redeemed people from every ethnicity by the blood of Christ shed on the cross. One day in the new heavens and the new earth, we will be swept into this experience of sinless life together with brothers and sisters in Christ from every ethnicity around the world. If God created every ethnicity, died for every ethnicity, and brings every ethnicity into his everlasting kingdom, then the church's job is to get in line with God's view of every ethnicity. We share the same beginning. We share the same problem of sin. And we share the same solution of the cross of Jesus Christ. And the same heavenly destiny if we are children of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The things that unite us are bigger and truer than the things that make us different. With that basic understanding in place, let's dive into the heart of the gospel found in Ephesians chapter 2. As we come to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul has given us a devastating portrait of humanity apart from the saving grace of God. We, uh, all of us, All ethnicities were dead in trespasses and sins. We were deceived by Satan and we were doomed to hell forever. But Ephesians 2 tells us, But God, being rich in mercy, even when we were dead, gave us spiritual life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we've been saved so that we can serve God. Ephesians 2.10, look at it. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, these good works include many different things. Uh, Some of them are very specific to who you are, your gifts, your talents, your abilities. But some of these good works are more general and universal in nature. And racial reconciliation is one of these good works that he has for us to walk in. Let's begin reading Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul is reminding the Ephesians that at one time, because they were not ethnic Jews, they were excluded from the life of God. 
There was division and hostility between the races, between Jew and Gentile. Because of the fall, there was no racial harmony. And all the nations outside of the Jewish people were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, Paul says. But now, I mean, what glorious hope-filled words. But now the Jewish people and all other peoples have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Before there was animosity and hostility between the nations. But now, through Jesus Christ, we have all been reconciled to God and to one another. This is the basis of of racial reconciliation, the finished work of Jesus. Paul continues and he says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Where there was hostility and alienation between the races, Christ has now established peace. It's emphatic. Do you see it? For he himself, for Jesus is our peace. And what does it say? It says, who has made us both, what? One. And that he might create in himself, what? one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Because of the death of Jesus, all the hostility between the races has been nailed to the cross. Okay, Jesus has reconciled us to God. He's reconciled us to one another. But it's even more radical than reconciliation. It's transformation because he's taken all of the ethnicities, Jew and all of the different Gentiles and created, get this, a new humanity, a new ethnicity called the church. Do you see that? It says he has made us both one and he has created in himself what? One new man in place of the two. Who is the new man? The new man is the new humanity called the church. Now, this does not mean that we lose our individuality or our ethnic identity in Christ, but it does mean that the biggest thing about us, the truest thing about us, is not our skin color, but our inclusion into the new people of God called the church of Jesus Christ. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, This is who you are. You are part of God's redeemed and reconciled new humanity called the church. This is our identity. This is who we are. And our challenge is this, to become who the word of God says we are. Now hear me carefully because this is key. We do not achieve racial reconciliation. It exists. It exists because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And we are reconciled. Okay, it's done. Racial reconciliation exists in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a reality that we must walk in, but it's already been accomplished in Christ. Jesus' death on the cross reconciles us to God and to one another. He's done it. Now it's up to us to incarnate this reality before a watching world. When we walk in the reconciliation Christ has accomplished, we live, get this, kingdom down and not culture up. I need you to see this. The importance of the gospel cannot be relegated to just merely trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. And when you die, you'll go to heaven. Yes, it's that, but it's much more. The gospel has entailments. The gospel has implications for all of life, for this world and the world to come. Relationships in the body of Christ and with our broader culture are gospel relationships and issues like racism and harmony between the races are gospel issues. So how should we live when our country is still struggling to achieve racial harmony? We live kingdom down when we live out the racial reconciliation that Christ has accomplished for us. 
Though Jesus has accomplished racial reconciliation, I still believe that we have a lot of work to do in applying that reconciliation. Now, though you may or may not believe that systemic racism still exists, we can debate that. We cannot debate the fact that it existed in the past and that its impact is still felt by people of color today. For many years, people of color could not secure business or real estate loans in our country because of the color of their skin. Question, how has this negatively impacted their ability to create a generational continuity of wealth that many of us have benefited from? For many years, people of color have not been able to live in certain housing developments in our cities, especially in the South. Housing developments actually had covenants that prohibited people of color from living there. What impact has that had on home ownership and education that oftentimes is determined by where we live? For many years, even though blacks had the right to vote according to the 15th Amendment, practically speaking, they were denied the right to vote through literacy tests and poll taxes aimed at suppressing voter turnout. How do we best move forward? Is there something more we can do to remedy the past while still moving into the future? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. And if I'm being honest, sometimes I believe that emphasizing our differences and the past does little to improve race relations in the future and may even make them worse. But as difficult as the issue may be and as futile as it may seem at times, we, the church, must lead the way. We have to actively, one person at a time, live out the reconciliation Jesus has accomplished We will never eradicate racism completely this side of heaven. But each of us can, in the power of the Holy Spirit, endeavor to live kingdom down and not culture up. What does that look like? What are some of the first steps that we can take? I'd like to suggest to you a two-pronged approach. We need to recognize the limitations of two past approaches, and then we need to fully embrace a gospel healing approach. Let's talk about the limitations of the two past models of racial reconciliation. Okay, what I call the relational model and the institutional model. Okay, let's talk about the relational model first. This is where we seek to make a friend from another ethnicity. And you will bring social change through one friendship at a time. Now, this is good because you don't have to be an expert in race relations to do this. This is a great place to start for most of us. Okay, find someone with different skin color and build a relationship with them. Ask good questions and listen to what they have to say. But we also need to recognize the limitations of the relational model. It's weak, it's an overall change strategy because it does nothing to address the historical impact of sin and evil and the way history has led to a structural injustice that cannot be changed by the one life at a time approach. The relational model does nothing to address the fact that people of color could not get business loans or live in certain neighborhoods because the system was rigged against them. Okay, then we have the institutional model. This approach seeks to create justice and equity by redistributing power among the different ethnicities through governmental policy. It seeks to bring change through public policies that say we should hire more people of color, help mobilize them to vote, and provide them with special loan programs to allow them to create generational wealth. Now, in a sense, this is good because it realistically takes into account the socio-political historical factors that often work against reconciliation, justice, and equity. But the problem is, this approach is too simplistic. It reduces relationships to relationships of power. It makes the kingdom of God about competition and power, not love. Our goal cannot be be to merely give the poor and the oppressed and the wounded the upper hand so that they can now be the top dog and take it to the underdog. Okay, our goal is to bring justice to all, not to change the game so that one group is freed from oppression so that it can oppress another group and give them a taste of their own medicine. 
This institutional approach left to itself will only produce continual cycles of resentment. Both the relational and institutional models can be useful in some context, okay? But their ability to help us bring lasting change are limited. What we need to strongly emphasize is the gospel healing model. Okay, the gospel healing model. This is where we acknowledge that we are redeemed and reconciled because of the finished work of Christ. But we also recognize that redemption accomplished must become redemption applied by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What does this look like? It means that we begin by looking around the throne of God. And what we see there is who we are now, even if we don't experience all of it now. Believers are people who find their identity in God's multicultural, multilingual, multinational kingdom of justice and love. So we are not waiting for a government program or something to get us excited about applying the work of reconciliation. We have something in Christ that can bring us into a deep place of unity and last longer than anything else this world can offer. The gospel can conquer every conceivable division and hostility in our world. This means we remember what Christ has already accomplished and we ask the Holy Spirit for grace and wisdom and opportunities to live out racial reconciliation now. Now, God has put a couple of things on my heart for us specifically to consider. First, we need to build relationships with people who are different from us, and we need to say to them, help me to understand what life is like for you. We need to ask that question, and then we need to listen to their stories. Back in the mid-1990s, the South African Parliament, in an effort to bring racial reconciliation to South Africa, formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The commission aimed at reconciliation rather than revenge and it implemented a strategy that was stunningly successful. The key to the model was the commitment of Bishop Desmond Tutu to hear the unvarnished truth in order to bring about a true reconciliation. A deeply wounded people found immense healing just by telling their stories and being sincerely heard. You see, there's a link between telling the truth and experiencing reconciliation. Why is this so important? It's not only important for someone else's healing who has been a victim of racism, but it's also important for us because before God can use us as his instruments of peace, he has to change our hearts. And the truth is, many of us don't see the need for racial reconciliation. We don't think we're part of the problem, and therefore we don't see our need to be part of the solution. Who can you listen to while asking the Holy Spirit to open your heart and to change your heart where needed? We must look actively for ways to bring God's kingdom culture from above down to earth below. When we talk about matters of race, I think it's very important to begin with the thought that because we all bear some sort of an ethnicity or multiple ethnicities, like my kids do, I mean, they're a little bit of Mexican, a little bit of Irish, a little bit of African American, that that shapes our view of the world. Here's what I'm saying. If you're listening to this and you're white, most white people do not consciously see themselves as being white. I really don't believe that. Sort of like, I don't consciously see myself as having two arms. It's just how I function. I want you to view minorities, though, as having one arm. If you're a one-armed person in a two-armed society, you are consistently aware of the fact that you've got one arm. So if I'm going to build bridges and have authentic relationships as a two-armed person with a one-armed person, There's got to be this driving sense of sensitivity and awareness and compassion towards them. Not as some pet projects, but I need to take some steps towards them. 
So I would say, first of all, you gotta flip a switch and go, I've been created with a certain ethnicity. My ethnicity, no matter who you are, African American, Mexican, uh, Chinese, white, no matter who you are, your ethnicity has some great things about it, but it also comes with some limitations. And what you need is, you need a multi-ethnic tribe of friendships who are going to press against your personal preferences and cultural norms, and in that emerges a beauty. That's why I think God's primary tool in sanctifying us outside of the Holy Spirit are other people. And you need other people in your life who don't see it the way you see it, right? So if you're a white person, let's say, um, and you, you, you have been raised with an ethic of the police are your friends. So if your cat gets stuck in the trees, we call the police, police comes over, gets the cat out. That's kind of your ethic. That's the world you grew up in. They were your friends. Well, if you're an African-American maybe, and you grew up in a different context, and police were not someone to be friendly with, but if police were around, it's because something drastically was wrong and you could end up being killed or going to go, go to jail, that's a completely different perspective. Now let me ask you a question, whose perspective is right and who's wrong? I don't think it's a matter of right or wrong. I just think it's a matter of seeing things differently. So what we have to do is check a box and go, I have a perspective, box number two, my perspective is not always right. And it takes humility to see that. And so I may be a part of the Fox News crowd, I may be, I may be a part of the MSNBC crowd or the CNN crowd, but what I need is if I'm part of the CNN crowd, I need my Fox News friends to show me a different way of looking at it. Instead of seeing things through a black and white, right and wrong perspective, now we've got some beauty here. Now there's the yin and yang. Corey Edwards, a PhD at The Ohio State University, she says this. She says, if you actually go to, to a homogenous church, homogenous churches actually entrench racism. Why? Are homogenous churches racist? That's not her point. She's saying, in a homogenous church where everybody pretty much sees it generally from the same perspective, then those perspectives get deepened and entrenched. The beauty of a multi-ethnic church is you, you, you have people who see it differently, who there's some give and take there. I just, not too long ago, white lady at my church, I pastor a multi-ethnic church on the West Coast. White lady at my church is the head of the Donald Trump campaign for Santa Clara. She asked me and our mostly African-American elder board to anoint her with oil and pray over her. Now we didn't do that in service and we didn't pray over Donald Trump, we prayed over her. But do you not think there is some angst among some of my African-American elders? Of course there is, but I think there's beauty in that. I love the fact that you can't label our church the Republican church or the Democratic church. So, so we, we've got to have the humility to go, there's different perspectives here. And so now I come into the relationship not trying to clone somebody in my image, but I come into the relationship going, you bring something to the table, I don't. There's a way of seeing God and seeing life that you have that I don't have. Let me learn from you. I think that's the beauty of it. And as long as you come with humility, I think the rest is a lot easier. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ that has entailments for every area of life. It not only saves us, but it transforms us by showing us how to live on earth as in heaven. Father, we need your grace to live kingdom down and not culture up. We need you to open our eyes and our hearts to how we can bring ourselves into full alignment with your heart because we do believe the gospel is greater than our divisions. It's the biggest thing. It's the truest thing about us. Father, how long will the Sunday morning hour in America be the most segregated hour of the week? How long will the lingering effects of animosity, injustice, and pride mark your blessed bride? Father, would you open our eyes and hearts to the understanding of the very real pain of those whose experience is different from ours. Give us a heart to weep with those who weep. Give us empathy to understand. Create trust where there's pain and make your church to be a united bride you want her to be. 
Change us where we need to be changed. And Father, would you give us opportunities to apply the reconciliation of Jesus Christ to our lives by building genuine friendships with people who are different than us. Father, we thank you for each person who calls Southern Gables home. But we would like to ask you to bring people to our church from different ethnicities so we might more completely reflect the multi-ethnic nature of your kingdom. Help us to invite them and prepare us to welcome them. Father, may Littleton and Lakewood know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you sent him to be the Savior of the world because of the way we live in unity and love. Teach us to live kingdom down and not culture up. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Don't forget to join us for one thing on Wednesday evening, October 21st, and put in your order for some Chick-fil-A. This is going to be a special time of praying for our country and praying for one another. Grace be with you all in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week. God bless you.